you're going to hear uh, from two people um, today. Uh, you know, one of my favorite people from long-term uh, relationship is Frank Forsberg, who's uh, the vice president for innovation and systems change at United Way. Uh, but Frank ends up wearing multiple, multiple hats. And today he's, he's speaking for uh, many minds. And Erica Moss, who is joining Frank this morning, is the executive director for Parent Aware which is the organization that provides the resources to help those uh, early childhood uh, education centers to continue to improve their capacity and their quality. And we're very fortunate to have you here, Erica. At this time, who is going to start? Frank. Let's welcome Frank Forsberg. Thank you. Well, good morning or afternoon actually, it's probably afternoon. So it's great to see you, great to be with you. Uh, the objective this morning or this afternoon is to uh, give you an update on what Mini Minds has accomplished and where we're heading in the next legislative session. And then uh, my colleague uh, Erica will give you a good update on how Parent Aware has been unfolding across the state and what's coming next uh, on Parent Aware. Uh, and we will likely get to questions a little bit quicker than an hour, so uh, be, we'll be eager to actually engage you in the Q&A uh, part of this. Uh, by way of background and introduction, I do work at United Way and have uh, for the last 15 years. Um, Ten years prior to that, I worked at Catholic Charities, and I spent most of my 10 years at Catholic Charities working not far from here. Uh, I worked at the intersection of Dale and University, and I ran a neighborhood office for Catholic Charities at, uh, in, in the Frogtown neighborhood. And so when I look back, I have 30 years of nonprofit experience, most of it here in the Twin Cities, and I uh, am just pleased to have, uh, I think, been fortunate enough to get up every day and work on something I care deeply about. And today, uh, you'll you know recognize that I'm uh, reasonably committed and passionate on this subject, uh, which is early childhood education. Uh, I work on it every day, and I'm hopeful that one day, before my career ends, uh, I and Erica and others can say, we actually have put all things in place that we think would be required to assure that all children in the state of Minnesota go to kindergarten fully ready. And it seems so achievable uh, that I, I don't think it's a complete dream, but I also know if uh, Eric and I and hundreds of other people don't work at it every day, uh, it won't happen. And uh, uh, so that's a, a bit about who I am. It also tees up a question a lot of people ask me, which is why do I work on this issue? And I, I wanted to kind of restate that a little bit differently People ask me and I say, well, you know, when I started my career uh, many, many years ago, uh, the data in the state of Minnesota suggested that half the children uh, who go to kindergarten go to kindergarten not fully ready. And we worked on it and worked on it for five years and ten years and we worked on it. We proved this and proved that and made a lot of headway. Art Rolnick wrote his paper, as you mentioned, and sadly, 25 years runs by and I'm looking at friends and colleagues saying, you know, the, the needle of progress has not really moved that much. And it seems kind of humbling, uh, again, when you live in the state of Minnesota and it seems achievable. And uh, so I want you to know we're dogged advocates. We think it's achievable. Uh, we're making headway. Uh, hopefully you will see that in our slides. Uh, I want to give you an update on uh, Start Early which is a funders coalition and also on mini mines uh, and then I'll pass the baton. So start early. When I re-engaged in this work uh, at a, a really significant level at United Way about four or five years ago and the United Way board authorized me to begin to work at the state capitol on public policy, uh, the first thing I did is I reached out to a number of other colleagues in the uh, philanthropic community. And I had a discussion with them about what they thought we thought was the best pathway to closing the kindergarten readiness gap. And we had a discussion 
took a while, but we came to the conclusion that between us all, we could not make enough grants to solve the problem. It's a very important kind of part of our story together. And so when this group of funders from across the state come together, we spend our time focused on changing public policy and public systems as opposed to grant making. And it's the first time at least this group of foundations is using its effort around how to influence public decisions as opposed to making a grant that might serve 50 kids or 100 kids really well. And I teed this up for the United Way board last week because I needed to seek their approval for a third year at the Capitol. And I just had to remind them of the scale of the problem. And it goes something like this in very simple terms. Every year about 50,000 children age five go to kindergarten in the state of Minnesota. So 50,000 is the biggest universe. And if about half of those children are not fully ready, we're beginning to narrow our focus to 25,000 children. Now United Way, as one funder in the Twin Cities, and a very large funder, can serve perhaps 3,000 children. I'm now beginning to explain a gap to the United Way board and others that we're leaving 22,000 children behind and have no meaningful solution without partnering with these partners and arguably without really engaging the state legislature in a public policy discussion. And so it, it takes a while for people to come to terms with the scale and the scope of the problem. But I think if all of us can begin to understand, at least in this issue of kindergartners, we're talking 50,000. And if you roll it back to four-year-olds and three-year-olds and two-year-olds and believe that the earlier we start, the better, now all of a sudden we're talking about 100,000 children, perhaps, who might need more immediate support. So again, scale matters. And I say that because it's a, a good challenge for this group of philanthropic organizations to make sure we're smart and that we stay on point with our influence in public policy. And these are skills that funders actually haven't practiced very much in the past. So we're still learning together. I'm very pleased from those conversations of four or five years ago where maybe there were seven or eight foundations. We've now grown to 27. And it's a statewide coalition, and we know if you're going to be effective in public policy, uh, you have to be statewide and have engaged voices and leaders all over the state. Once we agreed that we were going to work on public policy, we began to set our expectations, of what I think is appropriately, and set expectations for the board, our boards. And as you know, setting expectations around time matters. Most people expect change in one to two years. They expect solutions immediately. And we thought that's actually not how this is going to work. Uh, so we began to share with all our stakeholders a 10-year vision, which began, it had both pros and cons uh, to framing it that way, but mostly it allowed people to take a deep breath and realize we're not going to try to solve it today, even though we'd all like to. It was especially effective with legislators because legislators had kind of grown accustomed to hearing early childhood advocates come and want everything right now, and it wasn't possible. So this had just allowed us to kind of set those expectations. And we had a three-point agenda uh, that we wanted to start with that we thought would really matter and change the course of early childhood education. The first point was leadership. And this is again, you got to go back four or five years. We really felt when we assessed the history of early childhood that we were lacking a level of public leadership at the state level. And our conclusion was that we wanted to advocate for the creation of a cabinet level office that would be solely dedicated to early childhood education and that over time could be the 
public spokesperson, the public leader, uh, could have a bully pulpit, and could ultimately make better, more informed decisions on how state resources were spent that were now and are still now distributed over multiple state departments. So somewhere between 15 and 20 funding streams at a minimum exist at the state level that focus on one part of early childhood or another. And they flow through the health department, through the human services department, through the education department, and you can begin to see that the resources uh, may not always be aligned as effectively as possible. But our solution was to create a cabinet level office of early childhood. Now the recession arrived and it was not possible uh, for us to get that done in that cabinet level way. But we did get legislation passed four years ago that authorized the state, required the state to do a national study on Office of Early Learning. Uh, the funders paid for that study. When the study was complete, we used it to uh, work with the Dayton administration to take an open position in the Department of Education, a senior level position, and to create kind of the first Office of Early Childhood Education. And today, uh, Melvin Carter, who many of you probably know, and his uh, city council days were right here in this neighborhood, um, is a very dynamic and um, uh, energetic uh, spokesperson for early childhood education. And so for us, the first part of our vision, if not completely fulfilled, has progressed significantly, where we now have this public advocate at the state who travels the state, who works across departments to really champion early childhood education. So we're very pleased about that. The second part of our platform was all around accountability. And one of the things that the early childhood community along with the business community had identified as a weakness over the last 10 years was that the early childhood education system, if you will, was very diverse in terms of its delivery models. Everything from a home daycare to a school-based program and things in between. And that there was not a common set of quality standards and accountabilities that guided all of those diverse delivery systems. And because of that, there was an enormous lack of confidence uh, amongst policymakers, business leaders, other stakeholders, that money invested in that system really produced high quality results. And so this was a, a notable issue. What we had at the time five years ago is we had the work of the Minnesota Early Learning Foundation who had just completed a five year study and pilot testing of, in this case, the parent aware quality rating and improvement system. And so what we put on our second priority plank was that we wanted to take the success of those pilots and be a big champion for spreading the quality rating and improvement system statewide. Now Erica knows way more about the quality rating system and she's going to speak next. But the contribution of the funders in this case was not only to name it as the second big priority, uh, but a couple of years ago when the state of Minnesota state government went into a shutdown because of a little budget conflict uh, be, uh, we were having, um, the federal government released a request for proposal uh, for funding for strengthening early childhood systems and it's called Race to the Top. And us funders were able to take that proposal while the government was in shutdown, begin to engage stakeholders across the state in providing information. And then when the government came back online, we actually had an advanced start toward completing the proposal. Uh, the funders were able to put forward uh, dollars to hire grant writers um, and w served as a really helpful partner to the state of Minnesota. Um, in the end, Minnesota was awarded one of eight federally funded Race to the Top grants 
It resulted in $45 million of funding to our state and a four-year time frame to spend those dollars. And I believe we're just finishing year three of that uh, four-year commitment. It provided funding for many important aspects of early childhood reform and improvement. But one in particular is it was an accelerant to take the parent aware quality rating system forward and statewide. And so we could talk about other good pieces of Race to the Top, but that for today is the most important part of this story. And so when that was uh, <coughs> underway, uh, us funders began to get more serious about the third part of our long-term agenda, and arguably the most difficult part. Parent aware expansion is hard enough, I can assure you. But the more difficult part is funding. And the question at hand was, how would we convince policymakers to spend $150 million a year on early childhood education access so that the 20,000 low-income children across the state who were sitting on a waiting list somewhere could actually have access to a high quality program. And you know the rubber often hits the road when it comes down to money. Uh, as a group of funders, we reached out to many of our colleagues across the state who were working in early childhood, who were advocates of some kind, and we agreed that we would work together on one single request to the legislature. It's not quite that perfect and neat but it's way better than 20 independent efforts. Um, and we branded it Mini Minds. So Mini Minds is a legislative campaign, and it's very much focused on raising money for early learning scholarships to high quality programs. So that was a big accomplishment just to get a lot of people to agree to work together. In the past two years, our efforts by working together and many other good things that have fell our way, is we have now secured $28 million of new funding annually. And it serves uh, a little bit more than 5,000 children on an annual basis uh, with scholarships to high quality early learning programs. For most of us who work on this, this is the first notable investment in early childhood education in probably 15 or more years. And so it's providing an awful lot of energy uh, to the group, and it's beginning to build back uh, some really notable cuts to early childhood education that occurred in an economic downturn in the early 2000s, where uh, kind of a you know one big budget cut was more than an 80 million dollar reduction in basic sliding fee funding from the state of Minnesota. So we're on the pathway to building that back and providing more access. And where are we heading? The ultimate goal, as I mentioned, is $150 million for 20,000 children. This number might vacillate a little bit, but it gives you a pretty good stake in the ground on what we think the scale of the problem is and what the cost of the solution might be. So um, I did provide you some handouts. This is a handout that you have, and I'll just walk you through it because it's important to understand the principles of how Mini Minds is designed as a free market system. And again, we start with the vision, which is 20 million, not 20 million, 20,000 children who need scholarships. It's uh, important to realize that we envision scholarships being directed by parents. So when their child or children receive scholarships, we want the parent, to, who's I think the most informed advocate for their children, to make the decision on where that child would go for early childhood education. Um, we also think a broad and diverse delivery system is good uh, for parents to choose from and good for our state, because the delivery system across the state is different based on if you're in rural Minnesota or if you're in an urban environment, you have different choices. But in this case, we think there are about five main options that parents might select from. Uh, licensed center-based care, licensed family child care, 
preschool programs that you might often find at a local church or a nonprofit. Uh, public school programs. Uh, many of our school districts run terrific half-day programs, uh, Monday to Friday, eight to nine, ten months a year. And of course, we have a Head Start system that works across the, the state. All of these are good options for parents to choose from, um, but we want them to all be parent-aware rated and of the highest quality possible. And then ultimately, uh, the return on investment ties out to Art Rolnick's great research and many others, uh, where we know both the immediate result of kindergarten readiness, but also the long-term impacts on children's success in school and in life. That's our one-page pitch to legislators and other stakeholders. We use it often uh, to kind of get our uh, message across quickly. This is a rehash that it's $150 million for the uh, annual scholarships that we need. Um, sometimes putting it in a pie chart helps. Uh, and the green is what we've uh, uh, achieved, and the purple is what's remaining. The purple reflects, if we translated it from money to kids, uh, the purple reflects somewhere between 15 and 17,000 children who still need an early learning scholarship. This is an important message for us when we're out in the community because we often hear from parents who are really frustrated because their child didn't get a scholarship. And I sadly have to explain to them and others, uh, we have more purple than green um, and we need to kind of keep, we need to keep up the advocacy for more public investment. Legislative priorities for this coming year. This is draft. We're going to get through the uh, revenue forecast in a couple of weeks, and then we're going to uh, finalize this. But it gives you a good uh, direction on where we're heading. We're going to continue the drive for scholarships. Um, I think it'll be approximately $150 million. It could grow a little uh, because we're looking to add more access to children 0 to 2 and not limit quite so much children uh, 3 to 5. So we're going to expand so we get to some of those young children a little bit earlier. Um, and a reminder for anybody who follows this part of the policy system real closely that when the scholarships began to roll out two years ago, uh, the, it came with a very uh, defined limit of $5,000 per scholarship. And in the last legislative session, we uh, got uh, approval to lift that cap so it could be more flexible, meaning scholarships could grow to seven or eight or even $10,000, um, but we deferred the implementation until one year from now uh, because we need to secure more public investment. We didn't want to shrink the number of children who are already receiving scholarships. We also want to make sure we support the Department of Human Services in their work on parent aware. Um, as the race to the top funds begin to phase down in the coming year, uh, our state is going to need to increase its investment in the quality standards, so that will be a part of our platform this year is to support uh, the required increased investment in parent aware. And home visiting. Uh, we have a whole part of our agenda that we want to bring online beginning this year, which is what are the best ways for us to invest in really young children, zero to two, and their parents. And uh, we have pretty good consensus that high quality home visiting programs across the state make a really significant difference in the well-being of those families. Uh, we're going to start this year in parallel construction to our uh, scholarships, which is we're going to start by defining the quality standards for home visiting, get those approved, and get those implemented across a very diverse delivery system that would be both uh, public health providers as well as nonprofit providers. The Coalition of Mini Minds, there's a handout, uh, it's actually on the back of the visual, has in fact grown to be almost 100 members. I put 100 plus because I'm hedging positive. Uh, we got a lot in the pipeline, and, uh, but it's a very impressive growth for a entity that did not exist a little bit more than two years ago. Um, it's impressive in the diversity of participants across the state as well as the sector engagement. And so uh, we have uh, business organizations and businesses, healthcare, 
uh, with health partners and Children's Hospital, uh, many nonprofits, uh, on the ground providers, um, diverse from a cultural perspective, uh, diverse from a greater Minnesota Twin Cities perspective. Uh, we're making very good and strong headway on being a strong, focused voice, uh, a reputable voice on early childhood education. Again, the goal and my pitch to you is if you are interested in joining and helping in some fashion, we would love to have your help and an organizational endorsement, personal endorsement. Uh, you want to get engaged in lobbying, uh, we would be happy to put you to good use and good work. So those are my comments, my update on Start Early and Mini Minds. I'm going to welcome Erica Moss to the podium. She'll work through the update on Parent Aware, and then we'll be delighted to answer your questions. Erica? Thanks, Frank, and hello to everyone. Um, to remind you all, I'm Erica Moss. I'm the executive director of an organization called Parent Aware for School Readiness. It's um, the Parent Aware rating system is a public-private partnership, and so I'm the executive director of the private side. Um, a private, independent nonprofit that is helping to scale up the rating system statewide. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to, to be here today to talk with you about, an, to give you an update on Parent Aware. And so, um, just for those of you who are less familiar with the Parent Aware ratings, um, it's a little bit hard to explain. It depends a lot on the audience of who you're talking to, but I'm going to give you all three parts of it um, because you might have an interest. So the first thing that Parent Aware does is it, uh, it helps child care and early learning providers um, demonstrate and improve their quality. Um, we know, of course, um, from the work of many, many researchers and from the Art Rolnick work on return on investment that quality matters a lot for outcomes. Um, and we know um, before MELF started, we did a baseline survey around the state to look at quality of child care, and we found that quality is sort of low to moderate and very uneven. Um, so it depends a lot on where you are, um, what's available to you and your family. Um, the second point is about helping parents find quality. So Minnesota is sort of unique in using our um, this tool, Parent Aware, to help parents find quality. Um, about three quarters of Minnesota children ages zero to six have all of the adults in their home working. So those kids are somewhere outside of the care of the, the parents or adults who are primar primarily responsible for them during the day. Um, obviously the quality of the places where they are matters. Um, it's about a $1.4 billion industry a year in Minnesota child care is as a parent who pays out of pocket for two young kids. I can tell you that um, we spend more on a month on child care than we do for our mortgage and our family and, and I don't think that were unique um, at all. Um, and, and then finally, for parents, um, we know that it's difficult for parents to spot some of the best practices that child care providers can use to get kids ready for kindergarten. And it also puts parents in sort of an awkward position. If they're going um, to, to check out a child care provider for their children, you know, um, to go to say, oh, what is, you know, what kind of education and background do you have? You know, and hear the response and say, okay, can I see your transcript? <laughs> you know, to verify some of that information or to, to say, okay, you're using a curriculum. Um, and then as a parent, what do you, like, oh, so you are using a curriculum, okay. Which one is it? Okay. I don't know very much about that. Um, so you very quickly get yourself into a position where you're in over your head. And so a big part of, of developing a rating system was to help parents, to give parents some of these important pieces of information. And um, I was just looking back today. It's been a while since we've done it as a state, but I was looking back today at um, something called a household child care use survey that the Department of Education or the Department of Human Services, excuse me, does from time to time. And um, even when we did the last one about six years ago, we were asking about um, quality rate, about rating systems and about parent aware. And in that survey, a statewide survey of parents, 88% of the parents said that they would find ratings helpful. And um, disproportionate numbers of parents of color, non-English speaking parents, and low income parents said that they would find it more, find that kind of information helpful as they were making choices for um, their kids. Um, so we're really excited to be partnering with the state now to get to a point where Parent Aware is available statewide. Um, and the final thing that Parent Aware does, and what Frank was talking about, and the place where the rubber really hits the road, is it helps kids access quality. Um, so we're in a, in a position in Minnesota where there are not enough quality slots. 
um, and especially in the right places where there are where there are places where there aren't um, where there aren't quality slots for kids and where kids need to be in quality slots. Um, so that's a big part of what Parent Aware is working on. Um, and then finally, of course, this is the point that Many Minds is directly working on, not enough public resources to put kids in quality slots. So even if we had spaces available in childcare, for example, there isn't funding um, to cover the costs of kids attending those spaces. So those are all of the things that, um, that Parent Aware helps with. Um, I really think about Parent Aware as a, as a framework. You know, in and of itself, it, it doesn't really do much. But what it really does is organize a whole bunch of other things. So it organizes standards to help providers implement the things that help kids get ready for kindergarten. It organizes um, government investments um, and allows for those investments to be tied to quality so that we can, um, we can advocate for things like scholarships and say that there's some quality assurance on the other side. Um, and just a little bit of national context. So Minnesota is among about 38 states um, operating a system like Parent Aware. Um, and, I, and I would assume that will probably grow to 50 um, based on some of the work that's happening right now um, in Congress. Um, and I would say uh, in terms of Minnesota, where we are with Parent Aware, um, we sort of see ourselves um, in particular because we got um, some early funding and raised to the top dollars to help expand Parent Aware as part of, part of the leading pack on trying to figure this out. Um, and it's really, really great. Um, to be in a situation now where because of Race to the Top, many states are, are quickly scaling up their rating systems and are doing a lot of research and learning a lot. And we're able to share um, what we're learning with other states and to learn from other states as well. And I think that's going to make us all move forward more quickly. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, and talk about Parent Aware. So as of January 1st, 2015, Parent Aware will be officially a statewide program. Um, right now, as we speak, we're recruiting child care providers in every county of the state, and we actually have at least one rated provider in every county of the state. Um, so we've grown quite quickly. Um, in 2012, basically, was when we said we were going to be um, scaling up statewide, and here we are. It happened um, pretty quickly. Uh, so that's that's really it's a great milestone for us to hit as a community of people working on this and. Um, we're having, we're seeing such great success uh, across the state um, in greater Minnesota as well as in the metro area. And I'll talk a little bit about um, specific provider groups. So right now, um, in 2014, we saw pretty strong growth. We are, um, we're over 2,000 child care and early learning programs participating now in the rating system. Um, closing in on our 2014 goal of 2,600. Um, I'm not sure we'll quite make the goal, but we'll get pretty close this year, um, which is great. Uh, when we were putting together the Race to the Top application, the, the actual guidelines of the application say to set ambitious yet achievable goals. Um, we set really, really ambitious goals, um, some of the most ambitious goals in the country, and, and we're happy to be, to be really hitting or getting close to those goals. Um, I want to just pause for a second and talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of Parent Aware. Um, for those of you who don't know, so, so why it's so important and why it's such a, a, you know, a milestone to hit 2,000 or surpass 2,000 rated programs is that Parent Aware is comp entirely voluntary. So no child care provider, no early learning program is forced to get a rating. Um, providers volunteer. They raise their hand and say that they want to participate in the program. That's the first step. And so we've seen um, over time more and more providers raising their hands in response to the incentives that are available. So you can think about the growth in early learning scholarships and the, and the possibility that rated providers could serve scholarship children as being an incentive. And also we're seeing when we survey providers, in particular home-based um, family child care providers, that they're really starting to see parent aware or participating in parent aware as an, an important part of their professional development. There's a lot of training and education that happens with providers who participate. And um, it's, it's being elevated in the field um, as, as a way for providers to engage in professional development. So we're really proud of that, of that fact. And I wanted to just highlight, um, we just recently um, looked at data for which providers we're serving. So looking in a little bit more closely, and so you can see here, um, that, so these are providers, uh, self-report of providers, which languages they speak in their program or what the primary language is of the home-based child care provider. You can see that we're doing, um, we're doing well in 
Oh my gosh, I'm sorry, I forgot to put the key up here. Uh, the red is for child care centers and the blue is in um, family child care homes. Um, so you can see um, among English only speaking programs, we've got about 50% pretend penetration in centers and a little less than 10% of family child care providers. That's a statewide numbers. Um, in Spanish speaking um, programs, 20% of the centers and about 50% of the homes, Somali, 40% of centers, a little less than 40% of the, oh, excuse me, 40% of the homes, a little less than 40% of the centers, and then um, among Hmong, Hmong programs, um, programs where the providers are speaking Hmong in the program primarily, more than 40% of the homes are rated and 70% um, of the centers. So we feel, um, we feel good about this finding. We also looked recently at the race and ethnicity among the home-based providers um, that we're serving, and we found that, um, that non-white uh, family child care providers are more likely to be participating in parent aware than um, white family child care providers. Um, so these are, these are really important things as we grow as a program to note where we're doing well. Um, and then I think immediately you go to the next step, right, and say, okay, well, how big are these groups really, and how can we grow the number of, li of Hmong licensed um, family child care providers and get them rated? And that's something that um, I don't know how familiar you all are with the work of an organization called Think Small, uh, but they recently got. Um, got a grant that's specifically for that purpose. So working with um, child care providers um, in immigrant communities who are serving children but who are not yet licensed and working first to get them licensed and then going on to do additional work to help those providers get rated. Um, just to talk a little bit about, about the kids and where the kids are, I'll, um, I can use my little pointer here. Um, so we have right now, um, at the end of 2013, we had 38,400 children with high needs in three or four star rated programs. Um, this is, um, in terms of setting ambitious yet achievable goals for Race to the Top, this actually um, far exceeded the goal for 2013. Um, we feel uh, great about the work that's been done to target um, child care providers serving low-income children and bring them first into the rating system. Um, a while back, the United Way, um, during the Parent Aware pilot, funded, um, funded an approach of bringing in targeted providers early and giving them about six months of intervention prior to them receiving their rating. Um, so we were able to, with expanding Parent Aware statewide, expand that program and use that program specifically to target providers who are serving low-income kids. Um, and bring many of them into the rating system. 28% um, of children ages zero to five using the Minnesota Child Care Assistance Program attending three or four star programs. So obviously some of these kids are the same kids, um, but this is another um, thing that we look at in terms of our success. So the Minnesota Child Care Assistance Program is our government funded subsidies that help children access child care where their, while their parents work or go to school um, and already seen a lot of those children in highly rated programs. And in the last um, probably three or four years, um, we've actually seen movement of kids using those subsidy dollars from informal care into more formal care, in particular into center-based care. And so that's something that we're um, trying to understand more about. Um, but we know that it is in part due to some regulations that were introduced requiring that informal care providers take CPR and first aid training, um, that that resulted in many kids um, moving into more formal settings. And then finally, as Frank mentioned, um, over 5,000 scholarships are in play right now. Um, and I wrote that, they're, um, that three and four year olds have their scholarships, but actually um, a, a fairly large percentage, I believe 20% of those scholarships are in use by kids younger than age three um, because of of a provision that allows um, family, kids with siblings to use scholarships. Um, so it'll be interesting to see over time um, differences in outcomes perhaps in children that receive their scholarships younger than age three. Um, so we're, in terms of, you know, my work is really about, about scaling something, bringing something to scale. And so as Frank mentioned, we still have a long way to go. It's a lot of kids and it's a lot of child care providers. When we talk about um, home-based family child care providers, there are 12,000 of them around the state. Um, so we've got you know, more than 2,000 programs rated, but the universe is large. And so we've, we have to, to stay out there and to keep working on this. Uh, 
Other, just a couple other notable things that have happened um, in the last year or so with Parent Aware. Um, one of the things that was very important to the Minnesota Early Learning Foundation as it sunsetted into my organization as it started was alignment. And Frank talked about this too. And so within state government, the resources that are spent to train child care providers or to give information to parents, all of that has now been aligned with Parent Aware, almost virtual, you know, 100% basically alignment. And so we're all working in the same framework now. And that's allowed the second bullet to happen, which is for even more new private investment to come in and be aligned with that same framework. So, so no matter where you are in the state right now, if you're working on um, you're working on improving child care quality or you're working on getting kids into quality child care in, in the Northeast or the Northwest or Southern Minnesota. You're, they're all, everybody's working on parent aware. And that's really, really important. We have a unified set of standards. Um, everybody means the same thing when they're talking about quality. It's a big step forward for our field. I think it's really, really meaningful. And I think it, it also it sets such a strong foundation for being able to accomplish things together, like going to the legislature to talk about scholarship investment. You know, parent aware is everywhere in the state. Everybody is, you know, people are increasingly understanding what it means and working on it. Um, and that, that brings us closer as partners. So that's a really great thing. And then, of course, there's been some new investment, um, not only in scholarships, but there's been um, investment in that child care assistance subsidy program where now, um, you know, the first increase that's probably come in five or six years, maybe, um, was to increase the rates um, for children attending three or four star rated programs. So now the highest rates in that system are for providers who've attained a four star rating. Um, this, is, this is a little bit off topic, but I talk about it wherever I go because it's um, one of the favorite things about my job. We spend a lot of time um, trying to get in front of parents and to talk to them about the importance of ratings. And so we've seen uh, recently, a large increase in terms of awareness of ratings. Um, that for us is just the first step. We're really working on changing parents' behavior around the way that they choose childcare. So we really want to see um, parents, when they're looking for childcare, choosing based on ratings, talking to their friends and family about ratings, um, giving those kinds of recommendations, and then of course asking childcare providers whether they have a rating. We really think that um, to sustain parent aware over the long term, you know, as a childcare provider, you might do it the first time because you get a grant or some free training, but you're not going to do it the third time. <laughs> You've already had the training. You're going to do it the third time because you know parents expect you to be, be providing a certain level of quality um, and expect you to have a rating. So that's what we're working on. Um, we work uh, together really closely with the Department of Human Services and, and other partners. Um, we have information about parent aware that goes out through county social workers when um, families receive child care assistance subsidies or when they receive their scholarships. They're certainly hearing about parent aware WIC clinics. Um, there's a multi-language phone service available. Um, parents anywhere in the state can call an 800 number and receive a child care referral and information about parent aware in their home language. Um, pediatricians, I'm super excited. Um, uh, we have individuals from Health Partners on our board, and I know Health Partners is also um, working together with Mini Minds, and they're rolling out um, a, a clinic-wide strategy to talk to all parents uh, of young children as they come through Health Partners clinics about the importance of early childhood education, about the importance of reading to their children, about brain development. Um, you know, these were things that were, were probably done in isolated insta instances, depending on who the practitioner was in the past, and they're really working on building that into their system, and it's a really, really tremendous. We're um, hoping to uh, to use that as, a, as an example um, to share with other healthcare providers around the state. Uh, and then, of course, um, early childhood family education, Head Start, home visiting. These are all places where we're trying to get the word out about parent aware. <clears throat> and then finally, um, so the race to the, the top work will continue into the first part of 2016. There's been a little bit of an extension so that we can spend all of the money. Um, some federal help is actually coming. One of the probably the only things moving in Congress right now is a reauthorization of the child care funds that flow to Minnesota and other states, along with some really, um, really strengthened policy um, that makes that program work a lot better for kids and their families. Um, we will be um, well, the, the State Department of Human Services will be looking at the parent aware standards, so the actual things that child care providers need to do in 2015. And um, finally, bottom line, 
um, and why I'm not going to give you any to-do items because you should do what Frank asked you to do, <laughs> is that increasing access to quality remains absolutely critical. We cannot truly move the needle on this without getting more kids in high quality programs um, for the amount of time that they need to be in those programs to get outcomes. So that's, that concludes my remarks. I think Frank and I are going to share questions. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Maybe I, I missed it because I was distributing the cards. I should get right here. Sure. Um, how how many consultants and mentors are there going around the entire state, uh, both um, you know checking with the ratings, but also um, helping to build the capacity of these child care centers? Yeah, that's a great question. So I don't know what the sheer number is, um, but they work. Um, there are individuals who are located in local communities throughout the state. I think there are about 13 regional offices um, where people are stationed. And we have both what are called quality coaches. So these are individuals that would go um, into a child care center, into a, a home, um, sit with the provider, kind of watch what's happening, set a goal um, for a rating, help them um, you know, fill out the documentation that they need to, all of those kinds of things. And we also have a growing core of professional development advisors. So we're really interested in helping providers. Um, for a long time, it was just sort of like, oh, take 30 hours of training. And people took 30 hours of training. And we've really been focused on organizing that training to mean something and to amount to something. So to try to get, to try to help providers see a clear pathway for themselves to progress in their own education. Um, and so we also have professional development coordinators and advisors around the state. And as far as we've seen, um, you know, as it stands right now, we actually, um, <laughs> this is one thing I can say, we have enough coaches to meet the capacity or to meet the demand for rating. So, um, so of those providers that raise their hand and volunteer, there are resources available for them, um, a lot of resources in terms of reduced cost training, coaching, professional development supports. Great. This is also for you, Erica. So um, th this is a question that has to do with the fact that children are, are spending most of their time situated in families. Mm -hmm. And I do believe, uh, at least in, in my neighborhood, there were, there were like um, child care cooperatives where parents would sort of work with each other mm -hmm. and this question is um, you know could uh, many minds parent aware be, be working with groups of parents that would be coming together to share co child care responsibilities um, and help them improve their yeah, this is a little bit maybe of a technical answer, but I think the answer is yes, as long as those are um, in the context of being licensed, I suppose, um, as it stands currently. I think it'd be, it'd be possible to look at doing something. Um, this is something that we've talked about also in terms of, you know, there are still a lot of families that use um, family or friends or neighbors to provide care for their children. Um, it's something that I certainly did when my kids were, were really little. Um, they weren't in a formal kind of child care arrangement until maybe they were a year and a half or two years old. Uh, and so thinking about existing, existing resources and capacity, you know, in Minnesota, in every school district, we already have a strong early childhood family education program. Um, it's really um, has been, I think, maybe statutorily focused on families, but maybe opening that up a little bit uh, to be able to provide resources. Um, you know, oftentimes those teachers do visiting to child care programs and coaching. Um, that would be another way to get at that. This is, again, for you. Um, this has to do with the possibility of experiential learning for, for students, mm -hmm. um, especially high school students, maybe, maybe students that are having a hard time connecting what they're learning in school with real experiences. Mm -hmm. could, could there be some kind of program that might connect uh, these students with quality childcare places where they might get um, interested in early childhood mm -hmm. education and uh, you know, Im improve both you know, the, the kids that are coming into kindergarten and maybe help these kids actually graduate from school? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a good question about how you operationalize it and bring it to scale, but I know um, from my own experience at my, my children's child care center, uh, we frequently have um, kids who graduated from that program who come back and help. In the afternoon, we have, um, uh, we have people from who are pursuing their 
degrees or just getting started in degrees in early childhood and also high school students. Um, it's again just a question of, of where an idea like that would live and who could, who could bring it up to scale. Okay, th this is a series of questions, again okay. for you. Sorry, Brian, you I'll be over here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, can you give some examples of the qualities of effective child care? In other words, what yeah. are the things that uh, the rating looks for? Yeah, so I'll talk about the, the things that are really the most important. Um, one of the things I didn't mention when I talked about the fact that there are 38 of these systems around the country is that Minnesota is unique in wanting our focus to really be narrow and on the things that we know based on evidence or research lead kids to be ready for kindergarten. So for example, in some states they look at business practices. We don't do that here. It's not that business practices aren't important. It's that they're not the most tied to children's outcomes. And the things that are the most tied to children's outcomes and what we're really interested in working on right now is about working with providers to help them be really intentional in their practice with children. And you know, it starts with having a plan for the day. When, you know, when somebody is at a, at a one star level, it's just about thinking about it. What are you gonna do this week with kids? Um, and then as you progress up the star levels, it, it involves implementing a curriculum. So you have a formal plan for what you're gonna do. You're trained, in, you're trained in that formal plan. And it's not about like, let's do A on Monday and B on Tuesday. Um, these are really little kids. So it's about, um, what does the environment look like? How is it structured? How are you going to manage that child's day? Um, what kinds of experiences are going to be available to them? Um, how are the children going to direct and interact with those experiences? How are you going to support children? Um, and in terms of supporting children, we're really, really focused on and interested in um, getting all practitioners to understand, really have a solid foundation and understanding of child development and to be able to track children's development over time. Not to report it up, <laughs> not to report it up to anywhere, not to do anything other, other than to understand where each individual child in their care is and to be able to optimally support them in their development. Um, so when you're, when you're taking a break and you're having a small conversation with somebody who is, maybe doesn't have their colors down yet and they ask you for a piece of paper, you don't say, here you go. You say, oh, here's a blue piece of paper. What are you going to do with this piece of paper? Are you going to color on it? What colors are you going to use? Those kinds of things. Um, it's really just about being intentional in practice. Um, so curriculum, assessment's a big deal. Um, teacher training and ed education obviously matters greatly. Um, that's a large focus of the rating system. Oh, those are the big ones. Um, I'm going to add on to that because, as we were talking before, um, communities of color have addressed me about the cultural mm -hmm. competence mm -hmm. of these uh, different centers, and you know, say I'm uh, I'm an African American parent, but the the closest and best is is a white run system. What mm -hmm. guarantee do I have that they're going to know how to nurture my child? Yeah, this is a really really important question and something that we've been talking about for a long time and really trying to figure out. So what it says to me that we've been successful at. Um, bringing non-white or non-English speaking providers into the rating system is that we've really done a good job with the quality coaches, having quality coaches of like culture or who speak a like language, who can go out and be an ambassador for the program and in a way translate the program. Um, what we need to do a better job of is responding to the feedback that then comes back about what the particular standards are. Um, what, you know, in the pilot, I remember one, you know, as a specific example, we were doing an environment rating scale. Um, so looking at all of the, the things, all of the toys, all of how things were arranged in a particular setting, and going into providers' homes um, who, were of, who were from cultures where playing with animals was not part of their culture. Um, but saying, well, here on this checklist, it says you have to have animals to play with. <laughs> That was not working very well, and that was something. That's something that we changed. Um, I think it's really about being flexible and responsive. And then I think something that I think a lot about, um, again, as a parent with young kids, is this this idea about how it's so much more likely that wherever I take my kids, someone will will understand them and where they're coming from. And that's a really really difficult thing to embed in a system. Um, and we're trying to get at it right now um, by doing some training, um, but we're looking for much better ways of doing that and for also um, ways of, there's some work that Richard Chase and Betty Emerita are doing at Wilder 
um, not just ways ways to train people or, or ways to um, do things in that kind of a way, but ways to measure what's happening in terms of family engagement in a setting. Um, and we're interested in implementing some of those things in, in the next round of standard changes. Um, I think that would be important. And this is, again, building on this. It's actually pretty complex running uh, an early childhood center. I yeah. mean, it's kind of like a business, but yeah. you're also an educator. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a nurturer. So I'm, I'm curious, is, is what you're learning having an impact on those people who are teaching and training the people who are going into early childhood education? Um, I think it's probably too soon to tell um, what's going to happen with the provider supply. I mean, I can say that it, um, in terms of who's signing up or who's eager to voluntarily become rated, um, somebody who's just getting into the business is much more likely to immediately say, "What's you know, this is amazing. Uh, I'll take advantage of this opportunity right away." Than somebody who's maybe doing, you know, been providing care for 15 or 20 years, and who might have more of a reaction like, "You know, I've been doing this for a long time. I don't really want to put my business on the line. I have a good reputation in my community." Um, those kinds of things. So I think I think we'll see over time. I mean, I think certainly by design, you know, having a getting back up to the highest level, the idea the um, that the Early Learning Foundation put forward of having a market-based system for delivering early care and education is both that parents be able to find a place that feels really good and right for their family, whether it's a home or a school um, or a center, and also that um, that providers of any of those types who are able to deliver what we're looking for in terms of quality outcomes be rewarded and and hopefully enticed to have businesses. So I think it I would be remiss if I didn't if I didn't point out that nobody's getting rich running a childcare. <laughs> and in fact, a lot of people lose money doing it. Um, and so it's you know it needs rates need to be addressed um, if. If we're really going to place a priority on this as a community, we need to be realistic about what we're asking people to do. <clears throat> I promise you'll be able to sit down at some okay. point here. Um, do Head Start programs get parent aware ratings? Yes, Head Start programs are eligible for parent aware ratings. Um, I think we have maybe 92% of Head Start programs are rated, and those programs say the number one reason why they raised their hands and volunteered is because of scholarships. I can't remember if you put this in your presentation, but does um, the the rating system cost the child care centers anything? It's free. So um, providers volunteer. It's a free a free rating program, and actually there are um, you you get things <laughs> when you sign up. So you get free training or a grant grant money access to resources. I mean, I mean, here's a question about. You know, in, in this state, we've made these ratings voluntary. Mm -hmm. um, this question is asking, why? I mean, why shouldn't we this just be, yeah. you're going to do child care, you have to be rated. Yes, yeah, so I was actually, I was reflecting on this recently, um, talking with some colleagues about why it was the case that it was voluntary. And in some states, they do say, you know, step one, licensed, you're, you get licensed, and you're one star, and then you're in the system. Um, and they have folks participate in that way. And I think because of um, because these are small businesses um, that we're talking to and working with, um, we felt it was important that they have the option to opt in um, and that we make a system based on rewards and incentives rather than it being more of a regulatory system. Um, what my personal uh, feeling or one of the things that I thought about a lot is that you you value something differently when you raise your hand and sign up for it than when somebody says you have to do these things. Um, and even as it is in a voluntary system, a lot of the pushback that we get from providers is that they feel like it's being you know forced on them and, and government's coming in to further regulate their small business. Um, so I think that that reaction would be much, much stronger in the context of a, of a more mandatory model. Again, um, are you gathering any data in terms of the advantage that yeah. uh, early childhood providers are experiencing because they are rated three or four? Has mm -hmm. that made a difference in you know, the number of people coming to them? You know, whatever yeah, this is doing? super fascinating. So <laughs> we just launched a new website in, um, in August. So it's just maybe three months old or something. 
And, um, and now I spend all, all day long sitting in front of my computer screen looking at Google Analytics because there's so much information that you can, um, that you can get um, from looking at who's using your website, what things are they looking at, how long are they staying, all of those kinds of things. And so um, there's nothing definitive yet, but what we've seen since that website launched and the, the site does, um, does give rated providers a position of prominence. Um, is that um, that parents are clicking more often on rated providers, that they're looking at those profiles for longer, so they're spending more time looking at those providers. Anecdotally, um, I have providers who call me, most of them who call me are upset because the woman down the street who has a child care is getting all these calls and she's not getting any. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but we have, we've, we've done surveys of parents, uh, parents whose children attend rated programs for probably the last six or seven years and over time we've seen a steady increase in the number of parents who know that their child is in a rated program. Most recently we saw some incredible data, 60% of parents with children in rated programs said they would pay more for a higher rated program and that they would um, consider a rating the next time they chose a program. So, um, so I think we're at the beginning stages of seeing, um, seeing the market respond, um, but we feel really, really good about the service that we're offering to parents and of course, um, you know, the fact that it's backed by ongoing research United Way and, and my organization together are funding research to make sure that um, the things that we're asking providers to do are the right things for kids, that kids are actually making progress. So, yeah. I'm just going to do this last one, and then I'm going to call it Frank here. Glad I brought Eric. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Child Care Assistance Program, mm -hmm. uh, is the money that's given out there, do, do they require they come to three or four star rating, or is it only the scholarship money that's three or four star rating? Yeah, so right now the scholarships can actually be used with any provider who's participating in parent, in parent Aware. So we haven't yet limited the use of the scholarships to the three or four star level. That's something that we did during the pilot in St. Paul. So we were pretty confident about the supply that was available. Um, but as we look at rolling out Parent Aware statewide and some providers just having had an opportunity to get rated for the first time, it seems a little premature to limit scholarships to three and four stars. In terms of the Child Care Assistance Program, um, this is actually um, probably one of our top agenda, top agenda items along with scholarships this session at the legislature. The Child Care Assistance Program is not currently tied to ratings. Um, so those subsidies, um, parents are able to use those subsidies at any provider, um, including non-licensed providers. And it's something that we feel um, strongly that we're getting to a point where there are enough rated providers that it could be possible to tie the two programs together. It's important to think about the scope of each of these programs. So scholarships right now, we have um, $28 million a year. The Child Care Assistance Program, um, when I looked a couple of weeks ago, is probably spends about $170 million a year on children ages zero to five. So we wanna make sure before we make that kind of shift um, for, for kids and families that, that parents are able to find a rated program, um, that we're not unnecessarily burdening families, um, making them go an extra three bus stops to get to a rated program, things like that. So we're being really careful um, to, be, to be aggressive in making that link, but also to, to be intentional about how we do it and making sure that there aren't any unintended consequences for families. Thank you very much, Eric. I might Thanks. call you back, but I'll Great. just uh, let Frank stand up for a while here. Um, this is this is a good question. Um, <laughs> Frank, what, what is the Mini Minds um, uh, strategy for educating legislators about Mini Minds, about early childhood, and not just people who are elected, but maybe even people who are who are running as candidates uh, in the elections? How how do you go about reaching them and letting them know? Well, let's start with the, those who are, have been elected. Uh, we do two things for sure. Uh, one is uh, we always host at least one, if not multiple, educational opportunities for legislators as a group. Um, you know, if anybody who's done that know that that's a little bit hit and miss. Uh, we might pick up 10 or 15 legislators at any given uh, educational opportunity. And then the rest of it is uh, just basic 
hard work one by one. And so given the fact that we have a broad coalition, we've got quite a number of us who are able to go spend time with uh, legislators. And if it's 15 minutes or a half an hour or an hour, uh, whatever time legislators are willing to offer, we're willing to go sit down and have that educational discussion. We find that that uh, works very effectively. And then, as you know, it takes repeat visits to, for anybody to kind of really learn and understand. And so because, again, we're statewide, we have uh, colleagues and stakeholders all over the state who can go for coffee uh, with their elected officials and actually continue uh, to invest in that educational experience. And does Minimines offer training for, say, there are people here who would be willing to talk to their legislator? Will there be sort of little group training so when we go we're all sort of saying the same thing? And yes, two things. We have a website uh, for anybody who wants to go visit. Uh, I think if you just Google Mini Minds, you'll certainly get there. There's all kinds of educational tools there. Uh, but one technique that we offer is a speaker's bureau. It's a very standard speaker's bureau, so you would sign up for that, and then we do provide the training, again, for all our stakeholders so they feel even more prepared, more comfortable uh, out sharing uh, the uh, message about the scholarships and about Mini Minds. Well, th this is just a, a, a very nuts and bolts question, because you have a very important job at United Way. Does Mini Minds have a staff? I mean, does it have somebody who's working full-time for Mini Minds, or is it all people coming together and using a part of their time to achieve the goals? Yeah, it's a um, combination of efforts. So first of all, um, people like myself who work at United Way or Erica who works at Passer, um, quite a number of us uh, form a executive steering committee for Mini Minds, about 10 or 12 of us. Um, I don't know how much time each of us gives to the collective effort. Uh, but as an example, I might be, uh, you know, investing a one to two days a week of my time. Erica is giving a, a notable amount of time as well, doing these presentations and participating in the strategy sessions. And then what we've done is we've hired a handful of outside consultants. Uh, so Toonheim Communications provides nice materials you saw today, um, and we also have outside lobbyists uh, from. Bagri, Baker, Daniels. Um, so it's a little bit of a team of uh, leaders like myself whose organization is deeply committed, who give us a portion of time, and then outside paid consultants who round out the collective team. So not a traditional, here's your staff person model. But I think it's in the spirit of a collective effort. Yeah, I just wanted people to under, understand Yeah, that. many, many hands. Yeah. So, um, this has to do with basically the phase two part with zero to three. Yeah. Um, do you have healthcare partners already lined up to support the home visiting initiative? There are quite a number of home visiting entities already in place. So across the state, um, many of our counties deliver home visiting. Uh, so there's a very notable public delivery system. And across the state, but I think probably a little disproportional to the Twin Cities, there are quite a number of nonprofit programs who provide home visiting services. So for example, the Minnesota Visiting Nurse Association really is a noted and reputable provider. Uh, Way to Grow provides a number of services like that. Uh, the Metro uh, count, Council of uh, uh, Home Visiting uh, out in Dakota County. So there's a really a good number of nonprofit providers both who have healthcare experience and then some that might be more of a social service delivery uh, approach. And, and then the question comes around funding this initiative around home visiting. Are all of those people involved in Mini Minds already or are they going to be another kind of funding collective that will go to try to get increased funding for home visiting? Uh, many of these uh, organizations are already involved in Mini Minds, and they provide a lot of support to the pursuit of the early childhood scholarships and uh, the uh, emphasis on high quality programs. Uh, I think as time marches on and in the upcoming session, you're going to see a coalition of home visiting providers actively go to the legislature and seek funding. Uh, one of their concerns, because I 
just met with them last week, is that the federal government uh, in a couple of uh, funding streams has phased out home visiting. And the net impact to our state starting in 2015 will be a loss of between seven and ten million dollars a year of federal funding that has traditionally been provided for home visiting. And so they're they're quite urgent about this issue, and they should be. And so I think you can expect uh, that coalition to be active at the legislature. Since um, I think it was about three years ago now, both. Columbia Teachers College and Stanford School of Education were realizing how important this zero to three is, that um, kids come to early childhood education at age three, and doggone it, they've already got huge deficits. So um, the question here has to do with, okay, there may be lots of things we could do with zero to three. Why home visiting as the choice? I think as, as uh, I work with professionals and uh, nonprofit and public sector who work with um, families zero to two, zero to three, or with children zero to two, zero and three. Um, there are a couple of different points of intervention, uh, but I think if I could get them all in a room, the consensus uh, uh, approach by those providers as well as the research that backs it up all points to the effectiveness of home visiting programs. Uh, there are other good interventions, but I think there's pretty good consensus on the home visiting as a cost-effective way to uh, transform uh, you know, the skills of the parent and to see the uh, impact not only on the child that might be most immediate, but often on the other children, whether they be older or maybe younger than the primary child they're there to, to pay attention to. Isn't, isn't there some sort of a measure, if I remember correctly, that home visiting nurses and others can do just to check the child to make sure their hearing, their vision, and other things are okay that, that become really important. If you don't have access to that, your kids could be behind because you don't know that their ears are plugged. Or yeah, well you're getting a little past my pay grade, but uh, I, I think about this uh, uh, in two ways. Uh, actually, I've been spending a lot of time with Generation Next on screening by age three. Yes. So I can tell you, I can tell you uh, the humble parts I'm learning. Uh, there are very traditional health screens that are really important, and they, they identify the things you're mentioning. Uh, eyesight and hearing and a host of other really important uh, barriers if they're not, you know, if you're not seeing or hearing well. Uh, those health screens get done, I think, on a regular basis by all kinds of different providers. Very important. Really important that if something's identified that there's good follow through because we actually have a lot of gaps where maybe a child is identified with a particular uh, barrier, but for one reason or another the family's not able to follow up or maybe there's not a system ready to help them in an affordable way. And then second, um, what the school system has provided to their screening over the years is uh, more of a social and emotional assessment of how well is that child participating in groups, uh, what are their skills in communicating uh, verbally and, and in other ways. And you begin then to piece both uh, aspects together. And arguably, I think it's similar to what maybe the kindergarten readiness you know, standards might be, begin to assess. Um, I noticed in the in the list of all of the organizations that are kind of involved with Many Minds, faith community wasn't there. Uh, when I was the director of the St. Paul Area Council of Churches, we learned that a little over one in five congregations ha has an early childhood program in their building. It may not be their program, but in their building. Are you, are you reaching out to those faith communities to let them uh, make their child care provider in their building aware of what's there? Well, I think when I come back, I'll make sure that bubble's on there, uh, that it says faith communities. Uh, we are reaching out, I think, pretty well. Uh, the Minnesota Council uh, of Churches is a notable and engaged member. Uh, Catholic Charities and uh, you know just a host of different faith-driven organizations have signed on to support Many Minds and are very active. Uh, so I'll add that as a unique bubble probably more we could do within faith communities, uh, but I feel pretty good about the engagement uh, we have right now. Okay, um, this is, Eric, if you can come up too, because then we can thank both of you here at the end. But this has to do with, um, 
you know, we're getting we're getting more more money for uh, children to be able to go to uh, quality early childhood uh, education providers. Uh, is there some thought also of uh, providing funding for scholarships for people who want to go into early childhood education? <coughs> Yeah, that's a great question. So there is actually a small program that exists um, that is uh, federal money that flows through the state that um, funds, it's actually typically funds um, teachers who maybe don't have a background in early childhood to go, but are um, but are working at a center or a program and they want to go back to school and pursue a more advanced degree and that's something that um, that we're interested in expanding um, one of the one of the ideas um, that parent aware was thinking about was giving those kinds of grants to providers um, in rated programs to help them advance their education um, another idea that we had um, as the early learning foundation um, was to give to give that in the form of a tax credit um, to folks working in that field who want to improve their education. So it's definitely something that, that we talk about a lot. Um, getting, um, and, it, and it extends to getting, you know, the idea is really about training and retaining high quality teachers in early childhood. And there are a variety of ways that we could go about that. And it's, it's a huge priority um, for, for us. It's going to be a big gap in the future. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Erica.